Before we get started, the channel hit two really cool thresholds since the last video that I made. 25,000 subscribers and a million views. I don't want to drain this topic, but I'd be remiss if I didn't just take a second to say thank you for all of your support. I greatly appreciate it. Today we're going to take a second to discuss why I upgraded my Delta 36725 table saw to a SawStop 3 horsepower PCS. Full transparency, this video is sponsored by SawStop. That said, they did not give me a free saw to give a positive review for them. In fact, I reached out to them to see if they wanted to partner up because I plan on buying this saw either way. There was no stipulations on that it had to be a positive review. There were certain things I could or couldn't say. None of that. In fact, they even gave me a few extra months just to get the video done so I could actually use the saw and get to know it a little better and give it an honest review. So everything I say here is my own honest opinion, nobody else's, and be sure to stay tuned to the end when I go over a few things I think they could even improve upon in future models. Since I've made some modifications to my Delta, I may use some stock photos here and there versus the Frankenstein that I'm getting ready to retire currently. I'll start off by saying I really liked the Delta table saw. It served me well over the last six years and outside of it overheating twice when I was cutting hardwood, I've had no issues with the saw. So I will say for the price, it's a really solid saw that I've enjoyed using. So this video is not about me bashing the saw or bashing Delta. It's me going from good to great. Really great. There are some massive improvements with the saw stop. Some of which I expected, some I didn't. Obviously going from a $600 saw to a $3,000 saw, there's going to be some obvious ones. Like doubling the power of the motor, going from one and a half horsepower to three. But many of them I didn't even know I was missing until I used this saw. So why did I pull the trigger on getting a new saw when the other one was working just fine? I'm a big believer of investing your money where you're going to get the biggest return on your investment. About 20 years ago, I was researching what TV to buy, and a quote always stuck with me, and that was, people will spend 10,000 extra dollars to buy a nicer car that they drive 10 minutes to work and back, but they won't invest a couple extra hundred bucks to buy a nicer TV that they watch for four hours a night with their family. And that's just always stuck with me. So whenever I buy things or invest in things, I always keep that in mind. Am I going to use this a lot or not? And the same holds true for tools. If I don't plan on using it very often, or I'm not sure if I'm going to, I'm going to buy probably the cheapest option I have. Versus if I already have it, or I know I'm going to use it consistently, I'm willing to invest a little more money into that. Take these metal shears I bought from Harbor Freight a few years ago. I hardly ever work with metal, but when I built the flip-top workbench, I needed to cut a bunch of small pieces for the flip-tops to rest on. I've only used it one other time in the last five years, so I'm glad I didn't invest a lot of money into it. At the same time, I bought a Harbor Freight Orbital Sander as I didn't own one prior and wasn't sure if I was going to use it. I ended up using it all the time, so when the first one went bad on me, I invested in a much nicer one knowing I was going to use it frequently. Since I find myself using my table saw and miter saw the most, I decided that I was going to invest the most money in those tools. A big reason for that was reliability, quality, and accuracy. The miter saw was also because of it being low profile, being right up against the wall was important, and I wanted the better dust collection. And then for the table saw, which many consider the heart of the shop for a reason, power and safety were very important for me. So that explains why I bought a new saw. But why a saw stop? Why not another brand? I follow a lot of people on YouTube that focus around woodworking, that are a lot smarter than me, have a lot more experience, and they all have different styles, different techniques, different target audiences, and a lot of different tools. But one thing I kept seeing and noticing was that majority of them all use SawStop. So why does Bob Claggett, Brad Rodriguez, Izzy Swan, April Wilkerson, Jonathan Katz-Moses, Drew Fisher, Jay Bates, Nick Ferry, just to name a few, all switch to the same table saw brand while using any variety of miter saws drill presses, planers, things like that. Why did they all come to the same conclusion that that was the best saw for their shop? I can only assume that after my in-depth research, they came to the same conclusion for similar reasons that I did. The first of which is very obvious. And that's safety. As the channel started to pick up a bit, and I realized how much fun I was having doing what I was doing, I knew this wasn't going to be a couple of videos and then be done. This could go on for a while. I wanted to think about longevity and not risk something cutting that short. Pun intended. Now a lot of people as they're making a cut think about one thing, the cut. However for me as a creator, I'm thinking about the cut. Is the camera recording? Is it in focus? Will I be in the way with this angle? Suck in the beer gut? How's the lighting? 
Will I get roasted in the comments for safety by doing this? But even before I was a content creator, because of my awesome squirrel attention span, my mind did the same thing, only with different topics, such as the cut, what's the next step, what's the weather supposed to do today, will I have time to mow later, why did the Falcons have to trade Julio Jones, what are we doing for dinner later? If you're like me and easily distracted, these are all things that can take you away from what really matters. Now, I've gotten really good at pressing pause during those moments, but it only takes one time of slipping up to have an accident. A few years back, I jammed a chisel into my thumb, you know, for fun, and it cost me over half the price of what this new saw cost. The good news is it was a brand new chisel, so it was a very clean cut. The bad news is it was a brand new chisel, so it went almost all the way to the bone. Luckily, it was only three stitches, but that really got me thinking. If a chisel that I'm in full control of can do that kind of damage to my thumb and my wallet, what would a saw blade do? How much would that cost? And that was the number one reason I invested in a saw stuff. Second is dust collection. Now as good of a saw as the Delta has been for 600 bucks, the worst part about it is its dust collection, or lack thereof. It has a two and a half inch dust port on the back that attempts to collect dust around the blade, but in my opinion does a really poor job. The bottom of the saw is also completely open, so any dust not collected is magnified because it spills all over the shop floor. There's a reason if you look at Google Images for the Delta, you'll see a ton of modifications people have made to that saw for dust collection. However, if you search for the saw stop for dust collection, you'll find images of people just using the factory dust setups. For a factory saw out of the box that needs to be able to adjust and accommodate for what people use it for, the saw stop is very, very good. This isn't even including the overarm dust collection that can be added to make it even better. So to demo how good the dust collection actually is on this saw, I'm gonna do something I've never seen showed before. I'm gonna show you how good the dust collection is by, get this, showing you cuts without having the dust collector actually hooked up. I know, right? So I made sure the cabinet was cleaned out, no dust in there, and none in the hose or tabletop. I made 10 test cuts, and I did so without any collection hooked up at all. As you can see, a little bit on the top, a little on my shirt, a little in the cabinet, but nothing too crazy. And a ton came out the back of the port and still in the hose. Even after the cut, the air movement from the blade spinning is still pushing a ton of dust out the port. And this will obviously get better when you have collection hooked up. Even when I made a few cuts with the overarm in place, again not hooked up, a ton of chips shot out the back port. Which is crazy because it's going the opposite direction of the blade spinning. Almost any saw can have good dust collection if you have a strong enough dust collector hooked up to it. However, in small shops, most people don't have massive collectors with six inch tubing running through them. Me, for instance, I have a two horsepower Harbor Freight unit that cost me less than 200 bucks. So another thing that made it so impressive was just how efficient it actually was. This was mind blowing to me because even after the modifications to the Delta saw, where I felt pretty good of not having dust flying back in my face during a cut, there was still mounds of sawdust inside the actual cabinet which can be really bad for the motor when it comes to overheating and things like that. The point of this was that even without a collector hooked up, this saw was better at removing the dust away from me than my Delta was out of the box with a shop vac or a dust collector hooked up. The third is mobility. Now, even though this saw is 500 pounds versus 200, and it's a larger overall footprint, it moves so much easier than the last saw did. First, the ability to lift it is in the front of the saw stop. Just a couple of pumps and this beast is magically lifted into the air and I can move it in any direction. With the Delta, it's on the side and once I added the router table, it made it a little tricky to get to. That part obviously isn't their fault, but it's something to think about because you still have to reach under the factory wing to get to it. Secondly, the saw stop moves in 360 degrees versus the Delta that can only move side to side. This was actually huge for me. Since I use my workbench as an outfeed table, I normally have the table saw right up against it which means if I need to use my planer, I have to move the table saw out of the way, which you think wouldn't be a very big deal since it's mobile. However, because of how the wheels are set up, it can only be moved side to side. Well, I have limited space on the right, so it can't go that way, so it has to go left. But because I have my power, dust collection, and a few other wires plugged in on the right, I need to unplug everything in order to move it left. With the saw stop, I can simply pull the saw back and I'm good to go. No need to unplug anything, just quick and simple. Fourth is overall quality and accuracy. 
And I'd heard about this and read about it all over, but I never really thought of the Delta as poor quality. In fact, when I bought the Delta years ago, my neighbor told me, you know this is complete overkill, right? And I laughed and agreed, but who knew six years later I'd be using it on almost a daily basis. Anyways, from the moment I unboxed it, I could tell the saw stop was on another level. Not just from a table saw aspect, but from any tool I'd ever owned. From the solid steel fence rails, the cast iron tabletops, just the difference in weight and everything was surprising. Going from a mostly aluminum structure to steel was a huge difference. Even just the way everything came packaged, wrapped, protected, boxes inside of boxes, it was really cool to see, and obviously because of that, nothing came damaged. Even the instructions and part organization were like nothing I'd seen before. I grew up putting Legos together most of my childhood and thought they gave pretty good directions, but it's not even close to this. Everything is step by step, each step is color coded and grouped together so you don't put the wrong length bolt somewhere. And when you're trying to balance a 50 pound cast iron extension wing and level it properly, not having to undo something because you made a mistake is really nice. There's a manual for everything. The fence, the saw, the router table, everything. Not to mention, it looks great. From the cast iron top to the glossy finish of the steel, just a very good looking saw. I also think I might have a soft spot for this color scheme. I'm not really sure why. All right, I might legit have a problem. There's also the ability to fine tune everything. Whether you want to dial in the blade alignment, elevation and tilt limit stops, fence alignment, the throat plate height, the riving knife height and the distance from the blade, the miter gauge, all of the belts, and some other stuff I don't fully understand. There are legit 25 pages in this manual just for adjusting and fine-tuning the accuracy of the saw. All that said, it came from the factory dialed in perfect that I didn't have to touch any of that. However, it's really cool to know that if I need to, it's there. And five are just some quality of life enhancements. There are a lot of just small features that may not be proprietary to Saw Stop, but I had never experienced them before and I didn't want to overlook them because I'm sure if I haven't seen them, many others haven't either. Here's just a quick rundown of some of those enhancements this saw gave me over the Delta. The Magnified Fence Ruler. When I first saw this, honestly, I thought it was a little bit gimmicky. However, after a couple of uses, I instantly realized how nice it was. I have really good eyesight since I had LASIK a few years back. And even I found this helpful to not have to hunch over it and make sure it's just right. Next is throat plate removal. The way this plate locks into the front and the back is great as it eliminates the chance of it moving or popping up when you're cutting thinner stock or applying downward pressure on the throat plate during a cut. Next, access to the motor. Like I said earlier, I've overheated my Delta a couple of times and it was very tricky to get in there and find the reset button on the motor, simply because there's not easy access to it. If I ever need to do any work on it at all, I'd have to take the entire back panel off the saw just to get to it. With the saw stop, there's panels all over that allow you easy access from multiple angles, which would make the same task much easier. Next is a single rail fence guide. This goes back to accuracy. Having one solid piece of steel removes the play that a two-piece rail system allows. The two-piece is mainly for convenience during shipping, I would assume, but it really does make a difference when cutting wider pieces. I would just say overall, this saw is just extremely well made and you can tell a ton of time and thought went into the planning of the layout, the features, functionality of this saw. I'm sure there are many more that I'm missing and will discover the more I use the saw, but for now, those are the ones that stood out to me. That said, here are a few things I would love to see in future versions. These are very minor, but these simple changes could go a long way for some people. First is dust port location. Currently, there's a hole cut in the back of the cabinet for the dust port to go, and that's the only option which from what I know is common practice for most saw manufacturers. What I would love to see is an option for it to come out either side as well. Because a lot of people use outfeed tables, they may have a solid obstruction right in front of where the dust port is. I would be in this boat, but because of the gap in the back of the mobile base, it creates some separation for me, but it's still tight. A good example of this is to think about how most dryers are nowadays. They have the standard port in the back, which works for most people, However, they have punch outs on either side, so if you need to route the dryer duct out either side, you easily can. Since the blade shroud is connected to a flux hose inside the cabinet, it'd be easy to route it to the right or left versus only the back. Again, this is a minor thing that may not make a huge difference to most people, but could make a big difference for some with very little effort or cost on SawSaw's part. Second is height. I'm six foot, so to me the saw was a bit lower than I would like. It was about three inches shorter than the Delta. This was a bigger issue for me because I made my bench that I use as an outfeed table to be used with the Delta. Therefore, it was too tall to use with the saw stop. I obviously couldn't make the bench any shorter, so I had to make the saw stop taller. I have no idea how they'd even do it. Likely something similar to what I did, a little platform for the saw to sit on top of. They currently offer three different widths. 
a height option could be a nice benefit that I don't know anyone else offers. Again, many of these are extremely nitpicky and some might not even be realistic, but I wanted to just throw them out there in case anyone else felt the same way. Maybe it's something they could put into future models, which would be cool. But that's going to do it for this video. I hope you liked it and learned something new about this saw and now see why I and so many others are so happy with the investment in a saw like this. I personally love this saw and I cannot wait to test it out even further on future projects. If you liked what you saw or learned something new, be sure to like the video. If you're new here and want to see more content like this, be sure to check out the other videos on my channel and make sure you hit the bell so you're notified when new videos are posted. If you'd like to help support the channel, there'll be a link to my Patreon at the end of it. Thank you to my current Patreons for your ongoing support. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you to my gold members. Again, very much appreciated. Thank you. As always, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.